Welcome back to Celebrity Radio. It's Alex Belfield talking to really interesting people who entertain the nation and a producer who's been doing it for 400 years is Stuart Littlewood and he's joining us on the phone now. How are you? Yes, I'm fine. Thank you, Alex. Yeah, good. Good condition for yeah. a man of advancing years. Well, that's what it is, really. When I look at your CV and what you've done, it's a miracle you are still here because you've lived a full life, haven't you? <laughs> well, hope it's not over yet, to be honest <laughs> with you. I hope there's a bit more to go. Um, but yes, I started off, uh, you know, this year will be my 50th year in uh, in the entertainment business. Uh, so I started off a long time ago in the middle of the 60s when, um, when pop groups were just becoming really popular and uh, it was exciting you know there were no rules we made them up as we went along and uh, yeah it was it was great to uh, to live through that period just give us a few names of some of the people you work with because there were legends in there well i mean i started off with uh, with local pop groups uh, you know like the Dawnbreakers and uh, people like that but then i graduated i got a group called uh, arrival uh, from Liverpool and we had a big hit it was the first time I'd been on top of the pops mm-hmm. after that I got people like Mud and Sweet Shawaddy Waddy and the Dooleys remember the Dooleys I do My indeed um, and then um, somehow I got sort of dragged into the world of comedy and I ended up with people like Bernard Manning representing him Mike Harding uh, Max Boyce who's still with me today and of course Cannon and Ball um when they worked for me originally, they were called the Harper Brothers and they were on £100 a week between them, uh, <laughs> less my commission, of course. And um, and we managed to get them up to the, you know, I changed the name to Cannon and Ball and we, we took them on uh, and, and obviously became huge TV stars in the uh, in the 80s and, um, and, and, and had a great career, uh, fantastic uh, comedy act. Um, and then, of course, uh, Roy Chubby Brown, um, we've got Russell Watson now, uh, who I discovered about 20 years ago, and he's just come back to us. And then we've got shows. I mean, we produced uh, a show called Buddy, which ran in the West End for 15 years and toured the world and so on. Um, and then uh, another couple of shows, um, Abermania, who uh, are still with us and currently tour the world, as do uh, We've got another show called Oh What a Night with Kid Creole that ran for about ten years. So yeah, it's been a it's been a busy it's been a busy old uh, period um, oh, so period of my life uh, since I kind of left school and went into the entertainment business. Uh, it's been very busy and I've been very grateful for for what's happened to me. It's uh, it's been fantastic. And what an insight into show business it's been. I mean, I was lucky enough to interview Bernard Manning shortly before he died. I went round his home and there he was sat in his underpants. These were real characters, a bit like Chubby Brown, who their act is bigger than them. Of course, today people say, oh, it's not PC and everybody's playing the TV game of niceness. They never did that, did they? They just did their act and you took it or left it. Well, that's right. And I mean, uh, what we did with the... was uh, we always put on the posters um, if easily offended please stay away so you don't have anybody you don't have any complaints because you don't have anybody in the theatre who um, who should be offended because we've warned them in advance what it what it's going to be and it it does what it says on the tin he's made a a fantastic uh, living and entertained millions and millions of people by being controversial. I think a lot of the TV comics have caught up with him now, but he was kind of, uh, along with Bernard, they were the first ones to be to be a, a bit controversial. Um, and Bernard was a wonderful, wonderful man, as is Chubby, the, uh, outside of their characters. I mean, Bernard, I remember Bernard coming to see, he rang me up one day and I was particularly... Um, miserable and uh, upset and he said what's wrong with you and I told him that my mother was in hospital and you know she was probably uh, poor thing was on her last legs right he said come round and pick me up and uh, I went round to pick him up and uh, right let's go to the hospital well you should have seen him in the hospital I mean he was fantastic with mm. all of the with all of the people in there including my old mum but yeah. um, he was fantastic with all of the people in there and he gave them such a lift and uh, and uh, you know he didn't pay him for it or anything like that. He, he just wanted to do it out of the goodness of his heart. He was he was that kind of a man. 
Show business is very sanitised now, isn't it? And everybody plays it safe and it's become sort of a media game and a social media game. I, I love the characters like that and, and I know Bernard's very greatly missed the interview that I did with him still on YouTube and it still gets thousands of hits. People are still fascinated and curious by him. Well, um, I used to book his club. I booked all the entertainment for his club and that's how we got, to, to, we got together and he said, do you think you can do anything with me? So... I started to book him out on on his nights off and um, and then some late night shows and so on after he'd finished at his own club. But then I booked him on uh, on things like Michael Parkinson and uh, I managed to get him to Las Vegas for for a show out there and oh we had uh, we had twenty years together Bernard and I and uh, along with a guy called Chris who was his driver and then followed me as his uh, manager. Uh, Again, we took him all over the place, and he he brought laughter and enjoyment into people's lives. And uh, as you say, it um, it wasn't PC, and it, it wasn't perhaps um, mainstream. It was it was slightly controversial and somewhat controversial, but it was fun. All they ever wanted to do was make people laugh. Yeah. And it's not theatre manager's job to decide what the public should see. I've always believed that, that it is the public who will decide. And you can't convince them one way or the other. They're either good and popular or they're not. Well, yeah, I mean, it's very strange around the country. I mean, we have this argument with a lot of local authorities and uh, venue managers about Roy Chubby Brown. And I'm sure other people do with, with other controversial comedians, um, that these are public buildings and they should be open to all. And it isn't for the manager or for the uh, or for the local council to decide. I mean, they're, they're very uh, they fall over themselves to be uh, politically correct to all kinds of religious groups and, and other other ethnic groups. But if you want to see a naughty comedian in certain cities, you are not allowed to do so. Mm. Which you know seems to me to be uh, rather silly, really, and. Mm. Uh, I remember I did, we used to do a lot of pantomimes and um, I did uh, maybe 20 years of pantomimes at Bradford Alhambra and um, Billy Pierce was singing uh, a song Old MacDonald Had a Farm which you know every child knows yeah. um, or certainly did up to a few years ago and uh, the PC brigade said oh no no you can't um, you can't say old MacDonald had a pig you're going to upset certain members of the Bradford community this can't be done you're going to have to change it so um, I said okay and, and and then they said oh no you can't sing old MacDonald had a cow and that'll upset even more people <laughs> um, it's a sacred uh, animal etc et so you, you, you know I had to change it and uh, I went with um, I pers- <laughs> persuaded Billy that we'd have to change it Billy Pierce who was singing the song and uh, we ended up saying um Old MacDonald had a, a worm. Well, you can't upset many people, oh. you know, if you describe it as a worm. And um, and old MacDonald had a frog. And I remember being interviewed on Radio 1 uh, about this at the time. And they said, well, yeah, but what about the French? You'll upset the French. I said, well, we're not too worried about the French in Bradford. <laughs> oh, that's brilliant. Fantastic. Old MacDonald had a worm and old MacDonald had a frog. And this was to... To, to not upset the PC brigade. <laughs> Just out of curiosity, what noise... Do, I mean, I know what a frog makes, he croaks, but what noise does a worm make? Oh, I can't remember. He made up some, <laughs> he made up some funny noise, slither, slither, or something like that, you know, sort of a hiss, hiss, or rather like a, a sort of snake. Or something. A very small snake. Yeah. We got away with it. <laughs> That's brilliant. One of your big shows that's touring at the moment is Abba Mania, which I know people just love. The music of Abba lives on in Mamma Mia in the West End and your show, which has had international success as well. Um, we're never going to get sick of those tunes done well, are we? No, I don't think so. I mean, it's, um, I don't know, in the, in, the, in the 70s, people laughed at it and laughed at their costumes and laughed at the, uh, you know, simple pop tunes, as they called them then. Uh, but of course they were anything but they were intricate they were well written they were classics and and they will um, they will remain classics for many years to come I mean we've got um, we've got two casts of Abermania working at the moment one cast works in the UK and in Europe they're in France right now they were in Paris on Saturday my son was there and uh, they're touring France for the next um, 
three or four weeks. Um, but we've also got a cast um, uh, that performs in America. Um, and they were, I think they were in Florida at the weekend, uh, or they're in Florida coming up this weekend. So, yeah, it's, um, it's a, a great show in the sense that it plays all the tunes. It, again, does what it says on the tin. Abba Mania, if you like Abba. I mean, they go play, they go play the Palace in Manchester, uh, in places like that all over the country, and uh, and they sell huge, huge amounts of tickets. And again, they, they, they deliver huge amounts of pleasure. You know, when you see those people um, on a Friday night, all dressed up in their in their Abba wigs and um, and their their Abba clothes, and they're enjoying. You know, as soon as you turn on, I mean, I'm sure you know it anyway as a a radio presenter as soon as you switch on or start to perform a Dancing Queen the floor fills up yeah. and, and people's uh, even in, in your own home you, you, you smile broadens you, you people love it that song and, and not many of the other songs that they did of course but uh, yeah, I think uh, I think ABBA music will live forever, frankly. Yeah, you can't lose. I mean, you talk about people laughing at it in the seventies. I think even ABBA laughed at it in the seventies. The boys, Benny and Bjorn. I mean, even they saw how ridiculous it was. But their music lives on. And you've put on a big production. I mean, this isn't just some sort of sing along karaoke show. It's a big light show, a great sound system. Because without it, it would look a bit rubbish, wouldn't it? Oh yeah, I mean that's that's the the, the difficulty with presenting any kind of a tribute or celebration show uh, you can have the bad ones with the with the bad wigs and the bad costumes and the bad lighting that performs in a pub still performing um, lovely music um, or you can present it in a much bigger and better way in a theatre and people do uh, they enjoy uh, I suppose both versions of it but when you present it in a in such a way that you can charge you know perhaps uh, Twenty pounds or something for a ticket. Um, uh, you've got to you've got to put some production values into it, and you've got to make it look like it's uh, it's at the London Palladium or, or, or somewhere. I mean, back in the seventies, um, I promoted two ABBA shows when I was working with Danny Batesh at Kennedy Street, and uh, ABBA came to this country and they, they performed uh, four shows. Um, one of them was at Manchester's Free Trade Hall. And um, it was it was a, a fantastic experience. They just brought out the Arrival album, and they had this sort of sound of this helicopter la- as though it was landing on the stage. And um, oh, they were they were just fantastic. And of course, I don't know if you're aware of this, but uh, do you know what a Super Trooper is? No. Okay. Uh, well, Super Trooper is a the huge spotlight that you see in an arena oh, right. or, or in a big theatre mm. and they wrote the song Super Trooper on one of our shows in, in Glasgow and if you listen to the words I, I was sick and tired of everything yeah. when I called you last night from, from Glasgow, Glasgow. Yeah. all I do is eat and Drink sleep and, and sing, sing. Yeah. wishing every show was the last show and um, it then goes on, you know, you're like a super trooper like that's going to find me. And what had happened was he was getting um, divorced from um, Agnethia. Yeah. And uh, he'd obviously met someone else who was back home in Sweden. Um, and he was he was sick and tired of performing and going around hotels and traveling and so on and wanted to get back home. But, but his guiding light at that point was a... Was a, you're like a super trooper, like that's going to find me, you know, smiling like the sun mm. and so on, shining like the sun. Um, so it's interesting. It's it's a, a wonderful pop song uh, about a spotlight. Wow! So it's like a pin focus. How amazing! I didn't know that. Fantastic. Well, there you are. You see, I'm full of. Uh, I'm full of old rock and roll nonsense. Well, and you are, and that's what's great about you. You've worked with everybody and you get the business. Um, It has changed a lot. How difficult is it selling tickets now? Because, I mean, the people you work with, what's interesting, I saw Roy Chubby Brown last Friday in Leicester. He sold 800 tickets. A good pal of mine is Russell Watson, who always sells out. I mean, you you don't work with duds, do you? Is that deliberate or is it just that you've fell lucky with the talent that you like and appreciate? Uh, with Russell, I, I discovered him uh, about 20 years ago in a, in a 
work well it was a social club at the at the style women's prison uh, they had a social club there for the officers and for the staff and um, uh, I was encouraged to go and see him and it was a dreadfully wet cold February night horrible yeah. misty night and I drove in there and um, when I saw him uh, I was booking um, at the time I was booking the North Pier and I putting shows into the North Pier at Blackpool for a 16, 18 week summer season and um, I had one that summer with uh, Lily Savage oh, wow. so I um, so I booked Russell uh, when I saw him that night I, I immediately booked him as kind of bottom of the bill um, and I remember Kim Gavin directed that show who uh, went on then to, to do Take That and all those great shows that Take That do and he actually did the last night of the Olympics in 2012 a fantastic choreographer director this guy and um, he did the show for us and we had Russell on there at the bottom of the bill and he did 20 minutes but he, he stopped the show you know the, the audience absolutely loved it um, and then he went and did I think he went and did a Bradford uh, panto for us and then he did Blackpool the following year uh, at the Opera House with, with Jane MacDonald who'd just come off a, a TV program called The Cruise mm. and Russell was bottom of the bill again and um, anyway, what happened then, he, he, he went on to um, do a football ground, Manchester United's football ground, and uh, it was in 99 when they, um, when they were playing in the final of the European Trophy, the Champions League thing, and he sang in uh, the football ground in, in uh, Barcelona, and he, um, he was sensational. And this record executive picked him up at that point, and obviously the rest is history. He, got, he went and made the albums and became very successful. Um, and he, he, in this, at this point in time, he'd left us and he'd gone with these people in London and so on. And for whatever reason, it didn't work out. And then he got sick, and he had a succession of, of sort of managers and agents and so on. And then last um, last September. Um, he called me up and said, you know, do you want to come and have a cup of tea with me and let's, can we talk? And he said, I've, um, you know, uh, when I work, I do arenas and um, you can only do about 15 of them. Or if I do the big the sort of concert halls like the one in Nottingham or the one in Manchester, I can only do about 20. He said, and I'm sat in the house nine months a year. I want to go out and work. I want to go and sing. I want to go and perform. And so I persuaded him to to look at it in a different way and work without the huge concert orchestra uh, yeah. to work with probably, um, say, four strings, a string quartet, maybe a piano and guitar, and let's go and do all of the theatres that you missed out during your career, like Venice or Norwich or Aberystwyth or Canterbury. Um, and we gave him uh, 50 dates that then because people wanted to double up, he'd sold out and so on and so forth, has, has now become 60. And now, because of the demand, I'm adding another 25 in the autumn. So he's going to play about, uh, well, probably just shy of 100 shows live this year, um, which, of course, he's loving because he's getting out there and, and playing yeah. to his fans and to, uh, to the people that want to see him. And you make it sound very easy, but it's not. There's a lot of acts out there who aren't making money and are certainly not selling out. So this is extraordinary. We should say that. This isn't common in show business, is it? Well, no, it isn't. Uh, of course it isn't. I mean, but as you said earlier at the end, uh, at the end of the day, the public themselves decide who they want to go and see. I mean, yeah. we as promoters and producers can only put them in front of the... Um, in front of the public and you guys play your part because you do your interviews and uh, um, uh, I saw one yesterday with uh, with Russell which I think you did yeah. uh, that was in the Sunday Mirror yeah they wanted uh, it yeah it was a great interview he did with that actually yeah and, and, and so you guys play your part in in helping us to promote these guys to, uh, to put them in front of um, the British public and I mean the British public are under such a lot of pressure uh, for their disposable entertainment uh, pound or their disposable uh, entertainment income. When you look at the amount of shows that are on in any major city in the in the theatres there or in the uh, arenas or the concert halls, I mean, you know, if you wanted to go and or you could afford to go and see everyone you wanted to go and see, it costs you thousands and thousands of pounds, really. Yeah. 
you know, I just looked at the program for um, the Manchester Arena for the rest of this year, and I want to go to all the shows. And although I'm reasonably successful, I don't think even I could afford the tickets for that lot. It's phenomenal the lineup yeah. these people, these places have got. Yeah, it's extraordinary. And you've got shows happening all over the country, as you say. Russell Watson's on tour this year. Roy Chubby yeah. Brown's on tour, and Abermania um, is coming to a theatre near you. Yes, indeed, they, uh, they're they touring from April, the middle of April, and uh, they're going all around the country, places like uh, Wimbledon and Whitley Bay and, you know, Edinburgh to Ipswich and uh, uh, and Reading to, Reading to Darlington. So, yeah, all over, the, uh, all over the UK, you'll be able to catch up on uh, an ABBA show, and everybody loves a bit of ABBA, don't they? They do. It's brilliant. Timeless and fantastic. And you do it so well. That's the point. This isn't some half-bit show that's just trying to rake in the money. You give the audience what they deserve, which is a real feel-good show with big production, because without it, I think they'd suss it out. That's why it's touring the world. Habermania.com is the website you can go to. Stuart Littlewood is the producer and the man behind Handshake. And uh, really an incredible life and an incredible career. Keep on keeping on, won't you? <laughs> Thank you very much.